I'm part of the public procurement team and my main day job is dealing with challenges. So challenges on behalf of bidders against authorities and defending those challenges by authorities as well. So what's my interest in new legislation which hasn't even hit the uh, bookshops yet? Well, it's in seeing where the grounds for challenge might lie. So that's where I come from when I'm looking at this kind of thing. And believe you me, there are some wonderful grounds for challenge here. However, what all of you, I suspect, will be most interested in is having a wonderful, smooth procurement procedure which results in both happy sellers and happy purchasers. So I'll try not to dwell too much on the possible loopholes. Well, what's it all about? Um, I brought a copy of the directive along with me. Here it is. Uh, there's 200 pages there. Uh, there's 70 recitals. In the recitals at the beginning of this slot, the European Commission tell you what it's all about and what they're trying to achieve. Then there's 130 pages of the actual legislation. This is supposed to be a simplification exercise, but it's actually longer than the one it's going to replace. What I haven't bothered you with is 140 pages of annexes, which sit there at the back. So this is what I'm going to try and distill for you today. I'm a great fan of the EU. Um, I've worked in EU law since I started being a lawyer sort of 20 odd years ago. But even I have my doubts about the complexity of this particular regime. So before I launch into the main talk, I just wondered, can you tell me how many of you have actually been involved in an OGU process, a formal procurement bidding? Thank you very much. So a fair few of you anyway. So what am I going to deal with today? I'm going to deal with the objectives of the reforms, those 70 odd pages of objectives, an overview of each of the major changes. There's lots and lots of little changes as well, but what I've done is to group the changes into various sections to, to try and make it a little bit more user friendly. I'm going to try and explain to you why it was thought that these changes were required, what are they trying to get at, what the change is, and then I'm going to try and have a guess on what the impact might be and what you do day to day. And then at the end, there'll be a chance to ask me some questions. So how do we get here? Well, the last major reform ended up being implemented in the UK in December 2009. And that gave rise to an absolutely wonderful tool called an automatic injunction, where, whereby if you were unhappy with the procurement process and you were a bidder, you could issue what we now call a claim form, used to be a writ, and it put the whole thing on hold. That was the last major change. Lo and behold, some four months later, the EU European Commission announced a whole-scale review of the entire public procurement procedures and directives. So they, they announced a review. In January 2011, they issued a green paper. And they also carried out a lot of parallel, started a process of parallel evaluation. So they didn't announce policy changes. What they did was to produce lots and lots of questions, asking those involved in the process, people like you and people like me, what we thought about the scope of public procurement, what improvements we thought were needed, how, what worked well, what didn't work so well, whether we should try and put in society goals and to, to make life better for all of us as part of uh, public procurement. And they published all the responses to that in a report in June 2011. Now, lo and behold, this found that actually the public procurement rules were a great success and that they were saving people a lot of money um, and that they were saving governments a lot of money generally. However, they got a bit worried about diversity. They knew that there was a great deal of difference between the various member states and how you procured travel in France and how you procured travel in England was very different. So what they wanted to do was to try and bring us all in line, make one beautiful streamlined process so they decided to issue some more directives. So in December 2011, you had the European Commission publishing proposed directives for modernising EU public procurement. So you have a utilities directive, which is going to eventually come in. You're going to have a whole new directive to deal with the award of concession contracts. Well, you may well have come across concession contracts. There, for example, a classic example is the rail industry. It's where you get the opportunity to sell things to the public through obtaining a contract with a government body. Uh, so those so far are unregulated, but they are going to become regulated, and it's all going to look rather like what you already have to do in mainstream public procurement. 
And finally, the biggie of the, the, the lot is the one I'm going to talk to you about today, which is a new draft directive to replace the previous public sector directive, and that's the subject of this talk. So how's this going to turn into UK law? How's it going to turn into what you and I will need to do? Well, in January 2012, the European Commission started negotiations on the public sector directive, and this resulted in what was eventually known as the compromise text, and that's this thing. That's the compromise text. That's what they've spent um, a year and a half negotiating to try and come up with that. It was read before the European Parliament in October 2013, and the latest news is that it's going to be adopted by the European Parliament. That's when the, uh, those elected politicians stick up their hands and say yes in January 2014. In March 2014, it's going to be published in OJU, and the member states, that's all of the individual states of the EU, will then have two years to make it part of their law by implementing that directive. The UK is extremely keen on implementing this as early as possible mostly because of a few things that are contained within it that it's particularly keen on. And they want to implement it into UK law by spring 2014. Now, however, there's been a lot of slippage so far in the European timetable, so we wonder whether it's actually going to come that quickly. But that's the government's aim. They're absolutely determined that it's going to be implemented, and I would expect it to be implemented well before the next election. It's going to be one of the things they'd like to be able to use as a bit of a flagship. We've achieved this for you, the taxpayer. Um, and you, the, the buyers and the, the purchasers. So what are the objectives? What are they trying to get? Well, this is where the 70-odd um, 70, 70 pages and 59 recitals tell you what they're trying to do. And I've, I've got it down to two slides. First of all, there's some general public policy benefits, things to make this whole society a better place for us to live in. What they want to do, and this is really good news in times of austerity, is to increase the efficiency of public spending. So they want much better value for money. So this is trying to achieve value for money. They also, and this may well be music to the ears of some of you, they want to really encourage access to public procurement processes for SMEs. So SMEs are very much part of this agenda, and there are some quite interesting provisions put in for that. They also want to enable those procuring services to make better use of public procurement to support what they've called common societal goals. And what are they? Well, they're basically things to make society a better place. So protection of the environment, energy efficiency, carbon footprint, combating climate change, social inclusion, so disabled and people who've been out of the workplace for a long time, those are going to be able to be more included in public procurement processes. So, also, finally, they're going to try and encourage employment and secure the best conditions for the provision of high-quality social services, so those providing services in the health, education, and social services sector. You're, you're going to be able to include all of that in your procurement. And finally, they're going to try and encourage innovation, and they've introduced a whole new procedure to try and do that. They also wanted to try and improve procedures. Um, the first two there are basically about case law. And you think, well, what's reform got to do with case law? Well, there have been a couple of major cases um, which show flaws in the, the way the pure public procurement directives are so far put into, uh, put into law. So they're going to make those cases part of the directive, and they have done that. I'll go into those later. But actually, they'd be quite interesting. You may think it's going to be very dry, but actually, those are quite interesting themes. There's also a theme of simplification. They say this is a name. I'm not convinced. They also talk about increased to, their aim being to increase the flexibility of the current rules. This has been termed flexibilization, which I'm not convinced is a word. But there you go. Uh, they've done that. Uh, and those are the, uh, their objectives for impure, uh, improvements in procedures. Right, so change number one. Who's heard of Part A and Part B services? Anyone? Yes? Good. Um, at the moment, if you're dealing with this major, the, the present version of the directive and the rules, you have to work out, first of all, whether you're procuring or selling, whether you're going to be providing Part A or Part B services. Part A services are fully regulated, the full shebang, right from OJU notice all the way through. 
Part B is supposed to be slightly lighter touch. Um, and this is thought to be really confusing. Um, part B doesn't have as many procedural requirements and therefore the European Commission thinks that there is a risk that things like that are going to be uncontrolled and unchallenged, particularly because there are no financial limits on what falls into Part B. So you can have an absolutely massive contract that's something to do with the health sector, for example, and its Part B services, so subject to the lighter touch regime. Uh, there's also been loads and loads of case law in the Part B sector because although you're under Part B, you're also subject to the European principles of transparency. And they want to try and avoid that by making it clear what should fall into when and make sure that the big contracts are really properly regulated. So what's this change about? Well, in future, all procurements will be fully regulated unless they're expressly excluded. However, they're still going to keep what I think is probably an equivalent to Part B. And this is the lighter touch regime, and it's going to be designed to deal with things like, or they call them services to the person. So social services, health service, education, legal services, hotel and restaurant services, and a few others like rescue services, firefighting and prisons. They're all going to have a slightly lighter touch. Why are those permitted to get out of jail free by having a lighter touch? Well, it is because the European Commission recognised that there is actually only quite a limited market for a lot of that across the EU. And you have to remember that the public procurement rules in the, at an EU level are designed to encourage cross-border sale and traffic and so on. And they know that, for example, the health market in England, in the UK, with its NHS, is very different to the health market in France, which again is very different to the health market in Germany. So because there are lots and lots of special cultural requirements um, and the way people, for example, educate their children varies wildly across the EU. They decided that they, they should have a lighter touch regime because realistically, if you're providing education in England, you're unlikely to be providing education at a certain level in France as well. Again, we'll have to see whether that's actually borne out in practice because I know, for example, that universities are now selling a lot of their courses abroad. So we'll see. We'll see how this works. Um, Public passenger services by rail and metro are definitely uh, excluded now, and they're dealt with under a separate regulatory regime and all the concessions legislation when it comes in. So that's A and B services. Well, what impact is it going to have? Well, the lighter touch, so-called lighter touch, means that you have to have a notice at the beginning and a notice at the end. In the meantime, all you have to do is to comply with the principles of transparency and equal treatment. So, that's what it's supposed to be. Just you, if you're lighter touch regime, that's all you've got to do. However, I suspect that in practice, a lot of people who are procuring services will carry on basically running a, a, an ODU compliant process. We'll have to see if that, how it works out, but they may well just carry on doing it because they're used to it now. If you've got a value of less than €750,000 for the, those particular services, you're not going to be caught by the rules at all. But you're still subject to transparency and equal treatment and so on, so you can still be challenged. Interestingly, what we call the remedies regime, that is what you can do about things if you're really unhappy, will still apply. That means that you can still, for example, get an automatic injunction in relation to the lighter touch regime if you think they've done something a bit naughty, pursuant to transparency and so on. So if you're procuring services or if you're selling services, you'll still need to work out what the nature of those services is and whether they fall under lighter touch or not, and you'll need to work out the value as well. So it's simplification of a kind. What about preparation prior to procedure? Uh, well, in our little uh, legal framework huddle earlier on, we actually had some discussion of this because for some time now, there has been a bit of reluctance to actually try and scope the market before you start to sell stuff and start to buy stuff. Um, there's been a lot of nervousness about it because it is thought that if, for example, you start talking to all the people who might sell you things before you procure that, then you'll somehow skew the market. So there's been a lot of reluctance to do that. And that means, obviously, that a lot of procurement processes are not necessarily as good as they should be because you actually don't understand what you're procuring. So this is designed, and it's supported by the Cabinet Office, to support market testing, to enable those who are going to procure services to do so better because they'll actually understand fully what they're procuring. They have the necessary, they'll be able to talk to those with the necessary expertise. 
they'll be able to carry out preliminary market consultations so they can assess the structure of the market, look at who's good in it, look at how big the market is, whether the market can actually meet what they want it to do. So, um, however, there is a little caveat here because they're still going to have to watch out for the fact that it could be said that if you just talk to two suppliers and there's actually five in the main market, and one of the other is going to challenge if the contract eventually goes to the two you've spoken to. So you still ought to watch out because you need to make sure that the, in your communications uh, you don't give any particular bidder an unfair advantage. So there still will be scope for challenges from my point of view. So it gives a legal basis for things like market information days and so on. We'll have to see how it works out in practice, but in theory you are now allowed to do it, provided you do so um, following things like transparency and openness and treating everyone equal, which probably means you have to try and talk to everyone at the same time. You can talk to industry specialists as well. That's the second change. Now, the third change is a big change in procedures. Sounds dry as ditch water, um, dull as ditch water. Um, I'm going to try and make it a little bit more interesting for you. The things that stay the same... Open procedure. Open procedure is basically what I understand they have in the States. Basically, you announce you're going to buy something, lots of people tender, and you choose one. That's the open procedure. What we tend to be a fan of in the UK, and what will largely stay the same, is something called the restricted procedure. And that's when you go through a pre-qualification stage. You put a notice out there. You say, um, I'm going to decide who's best qualified. If you, if you pitch in, I'll decide who's going to go on the shortlist. The PQQ stage gives you a shortlist. And the shortlist is then invited to put it through there uh, to answer a specific invitation to tender. So that's, that's the restricted procedure. The other thing that's going to say the same is something that's almost never used, which is negotiated procedure without pu prior publication of notices at all. And I won't go on into that at all. So they stay the same. So what's changing? We're going to have some changes to the competitive dialogue procedure. We're going to have a revised competitive negotiated procedure and a completely new procedure called innovation partnership. So why are you going to have all of that? It's, try, it's supposed to encourage flexibilization and innovation. Whether it actually does so, you'll see when you've seen the next few slides. So just a reminder, this is what competitive dialogue is. Competitive dialogue is a, di a dialogue between the authority and the various bidders to try and develop suitable alternative solutions to meet the requirements of the authority before the award of contract. It's carried out in the sort of same way as a restricted procedure in that you find out who's suitable to have a dialogue with, then you have a long dialogue, and then you ask them to put forward their best solutions at the end. 